I don't know about you, but I love God this morning. I love His presence. I love singing His presence, His praises. Let me know when you get to heaven, we're going to spend a lot of time singing. We're going to spend a lot of time worshiping Him. You know, some do the old saying, time flies when you're having fun. Well, time will fly when you're in His presence singing to Him. It may just take a thousand years to get warmed up. Won't get tired of it. Just get the happier the longer you go. This morning we are continuing on with biblical authority, and I want to kind of do a recap. This is session four. We've been, I've been trying to build line upon line and precept upon precept. That we see in the garden that God gave man dominion over the earth. He gave him authority. He said, I want you to keep the garden, which means to guard it, to keep the garden, to dress it, which means to cultivate and to, and to do things. And Satan came into the garden. When man fell, man did not only lose his soul, he was cut off from God. He came under the authority of another. He lost his authority. We, you know, we kind of call it losing your soul. You don't have control of yourself anymore. He was cut off from the only source of true authority, and that's relationship with God. How many know that's not good? And when you look around in the earth today, men that claim there is no God, they are servants of darkness. They don't have the willpower, they don't have the wherewithal to come against the darkness that's on the inside of them. The Apostle Paul told us in Romans, we covered this last session, that from Adam to Moses, sin reigned. There was no competition against sin, that it absolutely reigned. And one of the reasons it reigned is you couldn't identify what it was. You know, I'm amazed today. You go into churches, and I train ministers for a living. And I say, define to me what sin is. And it usually starts out with a long, well... It could be this or it could be that. Some of them really tried to wax very deep theologically, whatever hurts the heart of God. But how many know that God very specifically in his word in the Torah said, this is sin, this is righteousness. This is good, this is evil. This is clean, this is unclean. From the moment that he began to identify what sin was, people could point it out. And therefore, it didn't rain. It was not some nebulous thing. And one of, the, one of the, the most strategic things I think the enemy has done in this day and this hour is he has separated us from the commandments of God. And once again, the church can't define what is good and what's evil, what's clean and what's unclean. Everybody kind of sticks their thumb up or their finger up in the air and to see what's popular. Let's take a poll. What's going to keep the people coming? What's going to bring in the most money? What's going to get me on TBN? What's going to get me on these different things? That's what's going to be popular. Guys, in the church today, because we don't understand that sin is reigning once again. It's time that we understand some things. Then the Apostle Paul went on to say, but listen, you know, Jesus came because the, 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 there were two reasons for the law. The number one, to show us what sin was and then to make it gross to make it bad so that it can be imputed to you so that you can say, that was bad, you did bad thing. And once you realize that was bad and you did a bad thing, then you needed a Savior. So law opens the door to grace. Without law, you can't define sin, nor can you ever respond to grace because you don't know you need it. Therefore, church is reduced to joining a club. And how many know there are a lot of clubs out there? We have the Light Show Club. We have the Jumping Church Club. We have this club. We have that club. And everybody, and what gets me is a lot of these club hoppers always tend to talk about their club. Did you see the manager at that club? Did you see the praise and worship team at that club? Did you see this at that club? People that are set free and serve God talk about God, and there just happens to be a bunch of people that serve God together, 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 and call it a church. When you're club hopping, it's all about the club. But when you're set free, it's talking about God. But I think what was strategic in, in, that, in that, 
argument of Paul in Romans, he said, now believer, now he's talking to believers, he said, lend not your members to unrighteousness, that we can either lend our, how many know that we used to always lend our members to unrighteousness before you found God? Before you found Jesus, that's the only way that you could lean. <laughs> but once you get saved, once you're born again, you now can choose to lend your members toward righteousness. And he goes on to say that whichever one you lend your members to, you are under the dominion of that thing. So under Jesus, I can be, uh, I can be a man under authority, under Jesus, and move in that authority and let righteousness have dominion over me. Or by the acts that I do after I'm saved, I can bring myself back under sin and its dominion, and I can let the devil rule over me and destroy my testimony for Christ. Now everybody take a deep breath. <sighs> Most of the church doesn't get that. In fact, there's a lot of churches today that teach you that you have to sin. How many know you, you can choose not to sin if you're free? If you're free in the Lord, you can say no to that sin. And you can say yes to righteousness. We also learned that your first line of authority is you. If you can't control this, you're not going to control anything on the outside. That's one of the first things that we're taught in the military when I was through going through the military in a, in a, in a situation that, is, that can be uh, tumultuous or dangerous. If you can't bring your emotions under control, you can't exercise authority. You're going to be the goober that shoots anything that moves to include your own buddies. The only way that you can take authority is you've got to have authority here. And so our first line of authority is learning how to take authority over our own vessels and to maintain our vessels in honor before the Lord. Now, this morning, I want to start out in Luke chapter 19, verses 9 and 10. You see, we, we have the situation where man fell, he lost his authority. But how many know that Jesus has a way of finding that which was lost? Luke chapter 19, verses 9 and 10. Now, this is part of the conversation or the, the, that he has with Zacchaeus. And every little kid in Sunday school knows about Zacchaeus. What was he? A wee little man. He had to get up in a sycamore tree to be able to see Jesus. And Jesus responded to his faith by saying, I'm coming to your house for lunch. How would you like to have Jesus come to your house for lunch? That's a good deal. Say, oh, no. <laughs> I forgot to do dishes before I come to church. <laughs> But I want you to see what, what he announces to the people around him in, in this verse 9. And Jesus said unto him, This day is salvation come to thy house, for as much as he also is a son of Abraham. Now I want you to notice verse 10 and the way that it is phrased. For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which is lost. Now, that, that, that which is lost kind of grabbed my attention when I looked at it in the Greek, and it's the same way in the Greek. The King James says, that which is lost. The complete Jewish Bible says, that was lost. And even the Amplified, I always count on the Amplified to give, us, give me a little bit different twist on the Scripture. It actually mirrors exactly what the King James says. That's a preponderance to me. Why didn't he say those who were lost? Or him who was lost? But that, because there was more than man that was lost. Man was lost in the garden, and the dominion and authority that God gave to man, Lucifer picked up and began to use, and the only one who could get it back was Jesus. That's why when he rose from the dead, he said, all authority is given unto me in heaven and earth. Why did he say that? Because he came up and said, I went, I went to hell, and I got the keys. <laughs> I got back. <laughs> I got the keys. I got it back. He came not only to save man, but he came to give you the freedom and the right to exercise spiritual authority and to say no to sin and yes to God. If you'll ever wake up to that, it'll change your life. That when temptation comes your way, you can say No. We think that to walk with God means I'll never be tempted. 
I remember hearing a preacher years ago, and he said, this guy in his church had come up and said, Pastor, please pray for me that I'll never be tempted. Pastor, please pray for me that I'll never be tempted. And the guy did this for weeks. And finally, you know, the pastor sat there praying with people at the altar, and he grabbed him by the shoulders and said, Brother, do you want me to pray that you'll die right now? Because as long as you're in this world, you're going to be tempted. The only way to absolutely move past temptation is to die and to go to heaven. But I can be tempted, but I have now have the authority and right to choose not to yield to that temptation. That's part of our authority. I can tell sin no. I can tell the devil no. Even all the scrambled thoughts that grow through my head, the Apostle Paul tells me in 2 Corinthians, I have the right to bring every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Because you have a thought doesn't make it a sin. Entertaining that thought and saying, oh, I'm going to make that mine. That's going to make my flesh feel good. I really, yeah, I want to thank that. And you take that thing in, then it can become sin in your life. Jesus gave us the right to do that. I want to go now to Luke chapter 10, verses 19, or verse 19. This is crucial. And we need to understand, when you, when you follow the entire scenario, when I start walking with Jesus, I am given a level of authority, but as I am faithfully walking with him, how many know that you know, your prayer life becomes more effective the more that you walk with God and the more that you pray, the more you learn the word? Our authority can become more effective. Now, these guys, are the, Jesus sent them out two by two, cast out devils, heal the sick, all these different things. They come back all charged up. Lord, even the devils are subject to us in your name, and they're all stoked. And because they faithfully did the basic things that Jesus said, Jesus turns around to them, and listen to what he says here in verse 19. Behold, I give you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing by any means shall hurt you. How many know that he just took them up to a new level? That level is available to every one of us if we learn simple obedience to God. When God tells you to do something, do it. When it says in its word, do it, do it. I mean, I woke up one morning, and I found out the Bible said don't eat pork. And it was never rescinded in the New Testament. How many know my ham sandwich had to go? My bacon had to go. My sausage had to go. Why? Because God said not to. And if I'm obedient with some of those simple things that are in black and white, the Bible says, thou shalt not lie. How many know that's a good idea? <laughs> if you be obedient, Paul kind of buffers that because some people think their ministry is speaking stark reality to people. Now, they want you to hand everything to them in kid gloves, but they want to shove it in your face. The, ha -ha. the Apostle Paul says, speak to one another truth and love. In love, let love buffer that a little bit. Sometimes you've got to ease people into truth. You don't need to slap them upside the head with it. But not to lie, not to bear false witness, not to do these things. If God said not do it, it has to, it has to be with me the end of the conversation. If I'll do simple obedience, I'm constantly in my life shutting the door to the devil and I'm opening it more and more to the kingdom of God. Because once I'm saved, I'm the gatekeeper to my own life. For the first time in my life, I'm the gatekeeper. I can say yes, I can say no. I decide what comes across my television set. And here lately, I have found out the reason for the off button. I found out the reason for the change channel button. Because there's so much garbage and you don't want that coming into your house. You change the channel, you turn it off. You can do the same thing in your life. These are things that my family does not do. These are things by, we, we, these are things we always do. These are things we always believe. As for me and my house, we're going to serve God. That's part of what he's talking about here. But I think that King James kind of muddles it a little bit because there, power is used twice in this verse, but it stems from two different Greek words. Now the Amplified, the Amplified brings it up. Behold, I have given you authority and power to trample upon serpents and scorpions, which always refers to demonic power, 
and physical and mental strength and ability over all the power the enemy possesses, and nothing by any means shall hurt you. Now that first power there is exousia in the Greek. Now I want you to listen to some of the definitions. The very first one is power of choice. Exousia means power of choice, that I can say no to the devil. When the enemy comes in like a flood, the Lord will raise up a standard against him, and I can stand in that standard, which is Jesus, and say, no, I'll not do that. Before, you used to be a puppet on the string, but now you can say, no, I have the power of choice. It also talks about physical and mental power, the ability or strength with which one is endued. But I love this, the power to rule or govern. It speaks of judicial power. Did you know that you're a judge in your own life? You're constantly judging. You pick up a sandwich and take a bite out of it, you can judge whether that sandwich was made right or not, can't you? This is good. This is not good. Basic judgment. This is clean. This is unclean. This is righteous. This is unrighteous. I, as an active part of the kingdom of God, can tell the devil, you know what? I bind you in this situation, and I I am exercising judicial authority under the one that I'm under, Jesus, and I'm saying, you can't be in this house. Everything of the spirit realm is, 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 is established in legalities. Any time that I have ever that we have ever cast a demon out of somebody, we, we have had we've had many times that demon said, "I have a right to be here because they got this, they did this." If you get them to repent of that, there's no legal right for that thing to be there anymore. We don't understand. Well, well, Mike, why does that happen? Because the Apostle Paul warned us, you lend your members unto unrighteousness, the kingdom of darkness begins having authority over you, takes dominion over you. But Jesus is saying, listen, I am giving you authority. You can exercise authority against, now the second word there, power of the enemy, is dunamis. Now, for charismatics, they get real excited about dunamis. It means miracle working power. We get, we, from that word dunamis, we get the word in English dynamite, dynamo. And Pentecostals get real excited because when you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you shall be endued with dunamis, miracle working power. But how many know the devil also has miracle working power? False signs and wonders don't mean that he faked them. It just means it points away from God. That's why Israel was constantly warned about false prophets. Everything they say will come to pass. They will work miracles. But if they tell you, abandon the ways of God, they're a false prophet. And then God goes on to say, now you're going to ask, why did I let that happen? To see if you love me or not. Are you loving me and you're going to take a stand for me or are you just going to follow after the play pretties? and the miracles and the signs and the wonders. And there's a good position of the church right now that are so after signs and wonders, they'll follow after the false because all they want are signs and wonders. Entertainment. I wish I was back at my old place because it really worked. And, and when, years ago, the first time I taught this, we had the, the hanging lights, the each, each one of them had its own switch. And so right by the pulpit, there was a string that I... It makes it so much easier because how many know that, prob, there, that there is a power plant behind what comes through these circuits here? And there is miracle working power in that light socket. Stick your finger in that, watch it make you dance, okay? It'll show you lights. It, it can turn on televisions. It can cook your meals, But you could have a nuclear power plant behind that pushing electricity out, and that's power. But all it takes is a little $3 switch to turn it off. That's authority. Everything in Hollywood today is trying to to magnify satanic power from Harry Potter to werewolves and vampires and... 
most you know most Christians don't because they don't have to study this. When you get into witchcraft, you get up so high where you begin going into Illuminati. You got to choose one or two paths: vampire or werewolf. Once you get so high up, it's all a part of witchcraft, and they're, and they're and they're they're showing just how powerful these things are. But all it takes is a little believer, a little switch, a little believer who has completely submitted himself to God, can walk into that situation. And wizards are, you know, wizarding, and, and witches are sending sparks out their hands. And all it takes is a believer saying, I bind you up in the name of Jesus, and I turn your power off. That's all it takes. If we really understand who we are and the authority of what we have, it doesn't matter the power that's exuding if you have an off switch. Am I making sense this morning? Because we're, going, we're, we're moving in a day and a time that occultic power is being sought out at all powers of government, all levels of government, all levels of social life. We can go, especially if you go out in California, some of the business classes, especially for women, are about how to use witchcraft to bring men under so that you can be lifted up. How to cast a spell and make a male sick to where he can't, he can't get that position and get that interview so that you can go ahead and get it. And how to bewitch a man to go ahead and hire you. That's being taught in universities today. And we call that regionally accredited good education. Cutting edge. I prefer not to be on that. How about you? But their worst nightmare is when little witchy poos trying to do their stuff and the guy interviewing is a believer. And he just simply says under his breath, I bind you up in the name of Jesus. All poof and no spark. But see, the, one of the things that we have been getting into, why I spent such a long time in Romans, if I have sin, that thing can have dominion over me. We call it an open door. If I get sin out of my life, and all you got to do is repent of it, bring it out of the blood of Jesus, and begin doing the opposite of what God says is righteous, I begin bringing myself back up under righteousness, and that thing has no place to connect. The word says a curse without a cause cannot light. There has to be something of like nature that it can attach to. They said, listen. Because I, I think this with Jesus is not only for them back then, it's for us today. We need to learn how to move in our authority. If you learn how to tell your flesh no and get it under, it will be easier to control a demonic force when it tries to attack you. Or somebody knocking at your door. I, mean, I, 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 I love to read. There, there are several Christian sites that really take a lot of things out that people aren't talking about in the news. And this woman was taking a shower in her house and she lived by herself. And this burglar who was a rapist not only broke into the house but got into the shower with her. Well, did she have her AK-47 or 357 Magnum? No, she had the name of Jesus and she backed that sucker plumb out of her shower. Plumb out of her house with nothing but the name of Jesus because she knew who she was. And she began to find out and begin to really walk with God the way that she was supposed to. And this is one of the scriptures that she meditated on. Luke ten nineteen. if you're not completely founded in this scripture, you need to meditate on it and memorize it and study it out, take it apart. Let it get deep down into your spirit. How many of us have ever worried you're an expert meditator. You were just meditating on the wrong things. Start meditating on God's word. Get it deep in your heart because what happens is whenever you get into one of those situations, and I've dealt with this on self-will, your, your frontal cortex shuts down. You can't rationalize with the devil. It's whatever becomes instinctual for you. And if instinctual, if your instinct is to run or to surrender, you're not gonna. You're not gonna have time to say, "Well, what, what was that, Luke? What ten? What? You don't have time for that. That's why we gotta hide the word of God in our hearts, so that when there's pressure on me, 
I immediately instinctively reach for the word of God and reach for the promises of God and the commandments of God. That's why God says if you'll meditate on these day and night, you will make your way prosperous and you'll have good success because every day all of us are are in situations that whenever there's an emergency, whenever there's a crisis, we pull out of what's in our heart. I would rather hide the word of God in my heart that I might not sin against him. Because when, when, my, when my brain shuts down, I want my heart kicked in and say, you know what, this is what I do. I take authority over. I bind you up in the name of Jesus. I remember one time, Mary and I were, and this, this is back in the heat of battle when we had uh, assassins and everything else coming after us because we were ministering to people coming out of the occult. And we're driving a minivan in this road, and I've, I've told you about the, the semi that lost control. I'm sitting there trying to pray, trying to drive, trying to eye if I can jump this ditch. And I think it was, it was a, it had, it had probably killed us trying to jump the ditch. So it was like, get killed by jumping the ditch or get killed by the semi in our lane. And Mary immediately, in the name of Jesus. <laughs> I mean, her, her mind kicked off. What was in her heart came out, and she began binding that thing up and commanding it to get over on its side of the road, and it was just like this thing. And it, it, just in a split second, you didn't have a chance to think. I'm thinking, ditch, and all I had was a chance to think, ditch, no. <laughs> and that, that's about all the time that we had. But it was already immediately coming up out of her mouth because that was what was in her heart. She had established who she was in Christ. She had established the word And so when crisis came in and your mind shuts down, what's in your heart comes out. I'm glad she said that instead of, Mike, we're going to (laughs) die. I wouldn't be preaching this here today. Guys, this this one you got to write down. You got to study it. This this meditate on it. Turn it back and forth. It's, It's key. And the people that usually fight me the most over this one are always the ones in bondage. Well, Mike, it don't really mean, the word don't really mean. You start playing those games with the word, you're in trouble. Then sin really isn't sin, and God really isn't God. And, and, you know, God can change his mind. No, he can't. I am the Lord, I change not. I'm glad because if, you know, if I was looking at this world right now, if I was God, I'd say, you know what? Why don't we just let the whole thing go to hell? <laughs> they don't praise me. They don't give me any respect. Look at all that I've done for them. This is the, this is the way they have decided to go. But he said, no. I've got a plan. Your honoriness isn't going to change my plan. What's going to change is if you come up under my plan or the devil's plan. I want to look at another one. Matthew chapter 16, verses 16 through 20. This again is talking about being a gatekeeper in your life. Now this is where Jesus is asking his disciples, who who does everybody say that I am? You can almost ask that today. Well, which Jesus? The New Age Jesus? The money Jesus? The oh, it's okay Jesus? The greasy grace Jesus? Which Jesus is it? Kind of going on at that time. Look what what Simon says here, uh, Simon Peter. And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, thou art Messiah, the Son of the living God. You are the one that was promised that was going to come. You are the one that is going to deliver us. You're the one who's going to reestablish the kingdom of God. He was saying all of that when he said, you are Messiah. So everything that the Old Testament prophets and Moses had prophesied the Messiah was going to do, he said, you're it. We're not going to look to another. You are almighty God. Come in the flesh. You are Hamashiach. Look what Jesus said. Jesus answered and said, Thou art, uh, blessed art thou, Simon Barjona. 
For flesh and blood has not revealed this unto thee, but my Father which art in heaven. And I say unto thee, thou art Peter. And he's actually kind of playing a word play here because Simon Barjona, it says, you know, you were pebbles. <laughs> Every time I think of that, I think of Fred Flintstone with a little kid, you know, pebbles. Simon, your nickname is Little Pebbles, but I'm going to make you a rock. Peter, a rock, because of the revelation you have. How many know it's a lot easier to go through a bunch of pebbles than it is a big old rock? The difference was who he realized who Jesus really is, that Jesus is the Messiah, that he's Almighty God come in the flesh. And then he goes on to say, he said, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock, not upon Peter, the rock of revelation knowledge that he is Messiah. I'm going to build my gahal. I'm going to build my called out people. Now, how many know that whether it's Hebrew, gahal, or Greek, ecclesia, Jesus was not establishing a new thing. When you look at the Septuagint, when Moses gathered the people together, it's Gahal in Hebrew, but in the Septuagint in Greek, it was the Ecclesia. The ones that were called out to really walk with God. Those that understand who Jesus really is and what he accomplished, and they give themselves completely to him and come under his authority shall be his called out ones, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Why? Because they've had authority reestablished. They've had that authority reestablished that was stolen from them in the garden. Because he is Messiah, I come completely under his authority and his kingdom. I surrender to him. He is Lord. He is Almighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. I give myself completely to him and his price on the cross, and I yield myself completely to him, and because I do, the gates of hell will not prevail against me. Why is that so significant? How many know there may not be, there may or may not be any missiles in Washington, D.C.? We don't know. The government won't tell you. But I guarantee you that in Washington, D.C., there is a button that will launch every missile this nation has, no matter where it is on the continental United States. That's the gates of power. The gates of power is Washington, D.C. The gates control the power. This is going to kick in in a minute. The gates control the power. And so Jesus was saying, listen, if you understand who I am and you yield to it, even the very council and the, and the government of evil that controls all the satanic power will not prevail against you because you know who I am. You really know who I am. And it wasn't enough. He said, now I'm going to give you some keys. I'm going to give you some keys. And he said, I will give thee the keys of the kingdom, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Now, let me know there's more than one heaven. Most people don't know that. There's three I've mentioned in the Bible. One is our universe. The second one is the spirit realm where Lucifer and all his crowd do their stuff. And the third is the throne of God. The Apostle Paul said, I was caught up into the third heaven. He was caught up to the throne of God, and Jesus had to set him down and teach him a few things because he couldn't rabbinically figure it all out. So Jesus had to say, you know, why don't you come up here, let's have a session. But where principalities and powers and rulers of darkness, they do all their stuff is in the second heaven. They prefer to control this nation and nations on the earth like puppets on a string. That's why a lot of times when I see congressmen and senators' mouths moving, I knew somebody's pulling the string, and it wasn't God. That's why sometimes they say some of the most ridiculous things I have ever heard in my life. Women don't need guns to protect them against rape. They need a whistle. 
then your daughter has never been hurt. You know, I prefer mine to have a shotgun, a bazooka, whatever she needs to protect her. It's idiots just pumping out this stuff. And at the same time, they have their own security forces that follow them around, fully loaded guys. They don't need to carry one because there's 10 guys around them with guns. They just don't want you to have one. They feed us all this stuff. There's a spirit behind that that's feeding it. Just like there was in Nazi Germany, just like there was in Rome. It's the spirit feeding this stuff. And I have authority that if it comes within my sphere of influence and somebody is beginning to manifest demonically, I can bind it up. When I bind it up here, it binds up its power here. I mean, even occultists with hermetic principle understand that so it is, you know, as it is above, so it is below. If you neutralize the demonic power here, it can't manifest here. If you, because there, there's a synergy. If you, guys, if you got, put a guy in handcuffs, he can't function. But it goes, it goes beyond just demonic power. Influences that are constantly coming at us. We have been given authority to say, no, I don't have to think that way. I don't have to yield to that pressure. Right now, our kids have more pressure on them probably than any other generation. We need to teach them who they are in Christ so they can say, my family doesn't do that. My family doesn't believe that. My fa- no, my family, that, that is not the way my family behaves. Do you know, I have seen little kids transform situations by taking a stand, a right stand. If they can do it, we can do it. Whatsoever I bind on earth is bound in heaven. Whatsoever I loose on earth. And I have learned that with, with both with physics and in the spiritual realm, nature hates a vacuum. If you bind sickness, you lose healing. If you bind up disobedience, lose obedience. He said, these are the keys of the kingdom that I'm giving you. That you can begin operating in these things so that not only do you not lend your members to it, but then you can be like Jesus was going about doing good, destroying the works of the enemy because you have been given authority to bind and to loose. You've been given authority to turn off the devil's power and invite God's power and his presence into every situation. Guys, that, that is going to be crucial for the days ahead. Because we're, we're going to end up with guys on TV using demonic influence to control the people. Well, Mike, that can't happen. There was a guy, a corporal named Hitler, in Germany. He was a nobody. A nobody that nobody wanted to pay attention to. Until finally one guy from the Thule Society, which was an occultic society, taught him how to use occultic power to sway the people. And he used television, or what, what was the beginning of television back then, and radio, to sway the people. Let me tell you something, you better learn how to walk with God and to say that stuff's not coming in my house. You have that right. That's the whole reason I've been teaching on this biblical authority. We, like no other generation before us, are going to have to learn to exercise authority in our lives, over ourselves, and over those within the sphere of influence that we have. We can create a place of safety around us. Have you ever been around people that just exude safety, that you just know that just long, when you're around them, everything's going to be all right? They're going to handle it. That's what Jesus is talking about here. That's the keys of the kingdom. That when I'm operating in God's kingdom, I can turn off the kingdom of darkness and release the kingdom of God in every situation. That's exactly what Jesus did when he laid hands on somebody. He bound up that sickness in them and he began to loose the power of healing to restore their bodies. Or the madman of Gadara, he bound up all the voices and told them, how about just listening to my voice? And because of Messiah, because of what he has done, he has handed that authority back to us. 
and we need to learn to exercise it in our day-to-day -day lives, every day. We need to learn to say no to the right things and yes to the right things and stand our ground when we need to stand our ground. And if you have kids, they will just show, they will really make you think whether you can stand your ground or not. They kind of push the limits sometimes, don't they? But you know what they're really hoping? Mom and dad, show me that there's a line that I should never cross. If you don't teach it to them when they're little, when they get old, they think there's no line which is everything about this current generation. So level one, you're Messiah, you're the Son of God. Level two, absolute surrender to the Messiah and his kingdom. Level three, allow righteousness to have dominion over you. Level four, authority and dominion have been restored. You as a believer, you are under Messiah's authority in his kingdom. And level five, you have authority over the enemy. That's a good place to be. Because prior to you coming to Jesus, the enemy had authority over you and just worked you around, got you mad at all the right things to do his purposes and, and got you caught up in infatuations and all these different things. And now you can say, no, not in my house, not on my property, not in my family, not in my life. No. And heaven will back you up. If you've surrendered to Jesus, heaven backs you up. And God's good enough. And here's what I love about Jesus. God's good enough to where if the enemy's starting to get in, I'm trying to hold my ground, and he has an open door. And I say, God, what's going on here? My authority didn't quite work in the way it's supposed to. God will say, yeah, but he has this. Just repent of it. Shut it down. Repent of it. Get rid of it. Shut it down. He sees this in your life, and that belongs to him. Get rid of it. There's been some times, Mary and I, you know, Mary's done some house cleaning, and there's, I've gone home sometimes, want to kind of wonder what's going to be left on the walls. Because there's been times God said, you know what, especially when you're having witches come after you and stuff. It's like they have all these contact points they can use in your house, and God says, you know, get that stuff out of your house, and all the craziness will quit. You got these little idols. And they may make them cute like little bears or whatever, you know. Get rid of them. Yield to the Spirit of God. Because I want, I want every one of you guys to learn how to be bulletproof where the devil's concerned. I want you to start destroying hell around you and being able to move an authority that's going to counter everything that's going on in our society today. And the only place that's available is through the kingdom of God. Now, Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, we just completely surrender to Jesus. We completely surrender to your word. Father, we agree with the Apostle Paul that your commandments are holy, they're just, and they're true. We agree with your word that Jesus is Messiah. He is the Son of the living God. He is the one who gave us the commandments so that we would need him and know that we needed him. And it's those very commandments that are the foundation of the kingdom. And Father, let us exercise authority the way that Jesus would in every area of our lives, we ask in Jesus' name.